been talking about. So um, when it comes to the power, I mean, there is no rival to Jesus Christ. Amen. There is no rival. There's rivalries that continually try to fight for position and in our lives. But there is no rival. Jesus Christ is the one who should be sitting on our thrones. But even if we're not allowing him to sit on the thrones of our hearts, um, we have to know that there is nobody out there that can even touch anything our Lord has. And so I've been really excited about all that God's been doing these past few weeks. Um, the challenges that he's brought forth, I hope and pray that he's challenged you all these last three, three weeks when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission when it comes to doing what we're supposed to be doing as the church body. Amen? I mean, our job is to do what God asks us to do, and what he's asked us to do is to go out and to share the gospel with other people. And I think that he's been working in our hearts and preparing us for a, a moment like this, for today. Because today there's going to be a challenge that's given to us, and you're going to have the opportunity to commit some things to back to the Lord and what he's already done in and through your lives. And so some of you guys might have the yellow book. Some of you may not. Uh, we have no more to give. They've all been handed out, right? But this is, uh, take it personally, it's been the series that we've been going through. For those of you that may be the first time you've been sitting during this series. And really what this has been is a passage, or I'm sorry, a book that was built around sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and how we need to take it personal and how that we ought to um, really see what scriptures say and make sure that it becomes every fiber of who we are. And so um, just a quick review from the past three weeks. The first week when we started, we started out with making a difference. That was the, the title of that chapter, making a difference. And um, we really talked about the value of one. You know, how much one soul, how valuable that one soul is to God and if it's that one soul is valuable to God, it should be valuable to us, right? We're Christians. We're little Christs. We are his children. We, if you've trusted in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you should, we should be thinking as he thinks. And people are valuable. That means that uh, you're going to invest into what's important with God. And, and I like that word value because uh, it means something. It, so many people today don't feel like they're valuable. They feel like... Uh, because of the things of this world, maybe their home life, whatever it might be, they don't feel very valuable. But to God, you are worth dying for. And then that second week, we talked about presenting the gospel. And this was a neat week because we were able to actually see a video of someone sharing the gospel with somebody else. But we spoke with how to, the how to share the gospel. And in that yellow book has a list of Verses of Romans Road is what we say that are good to memorize to be able to lead somebody to Christ and share with them the gospel and the truth. And, but we also talked about what a lost person, a person who doesn't know Christ, what that person needs to know. And that person really needs to be lost before they're saved. They have to recognize who they are standing before a true living God. When they stand before a holy God, how do you reflect? You know, I mean... Uh, you know, you have the question, if you were to die today, why should God let you in his heaven? You know, how do you stand before perfection? How do you stand before holiness? And we talked about that. First, a person really needs to know that God loves them. Isn't that good to know that there's a true God, that's a creator that loves you? I mean, a person needs to know that God loves them, that they are loved. But then they need to know, again, how they stand before the Lord. They also need to know that because of that violation of God's law, there's a penalty to sin. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there's a penalty. But that sinner, that lost person, needs to also know that God died for them as a sinner. They did not have to make their life better, to get their life right, and then go to a holy God. They had to go to the great physician to heal them, to make them whole, so they can serve a holy God. Amen? Amen. And then the simple way of knowing how to enter into that relationship was just placing your uh, faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's that confession of faith. And, and again, we got to see the video of Sean Summers sharing the gospel with someone in Honduras leading that man to Christ. Beautiful picture. I mean, we couldn't have orchestrated it any better. That was all God. And then last week, we talked about what now? The establishing a new Christian. 
What happens after a person gets saved? What's next? If you remember correctly, there are two questions that we spoke about. One in Acts chapter 16 where the Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved, right? And you got to believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's what the passage says. But we also spoke about the second question, what wilt thou have me to do out of Acts chapter 9? See, there should be something that immediately comes after, uh, what must I do to be saved? And what comes after is, what do I do now? And God has a plan and we have to establish new believers, right? And so we spoke about the assurance of salvation. That new believer needs to know what it means to be a Christian and lead them to a place of commitment through baptism. And we also spoke about the church attendance. You know, it's important to be at a place to where they can grow and thrive and to be involved because that's what the church is about. That's one of the areas a church exists is to be able to take a person that's newly saved, watch them grow, Mature into a believer, unto a place of Christ-likeness. That's our responsibility. So that's what we spoke about the last three weeks. And this week, we're also going to be discussing the next step, which is this fourth part. And in this fourth part, each, each one of these lessons, are, the outlines are already there. And I know this because you have the book in front of you. My outline is the same outline you have. That's how you're following, being able to fill in your blanks. But God working in and through this outline, each chapter has had an illustration, okay? And we, if you remember, we talked about the barber that had a, kind of the bad timing and asking if he was ready to meet God, you know, when he had, he's getting ready to shave the guy and he's got a knife and getting ready to shave him and says, are you ready to meet God, you know? So that's kind of bad timing to ask somebody if they're ready to meet God, right? So there was also a, in this one too, there was an illustration, and it was really connected to gardening. And there was a whole page on gardening, you know, and talked a little bit about that. And um, once I started thinking about this, it directly took me back to Zambia. And I started thinking about when Titus and I lived in Zambia. Um, that's still an agricultural country. Everything's built on agriculture. And there was a man by the name of Samuel Bonda. He's a pastor now. He started a church in one of the towns, and um, one of the biggest Zambians you'll ever see. You remember Samuel? Um, you don't see very many big Zambians, so when you, when you find them, they, they stick out. They're always, you know, you, you remember them. But he, what he did was he took Titus under his wing dirt while he was in school at North Star Bible Institute, and he taught Titus how to garden Zambian style, right? And it was really neat. They, they built a friendship, and out back of our house, we built a little area with a fence so the dogs could not get to um, get to our, our vegetation and, and, and these, uh, not crops, but our vegetables. Um, and he taught him in the Zambian way. So he, he gave him a hoe. They called it Ise over there. And we got a hoe for him. And he got out there with Titus, showed him how to cultivate the land and how to make the borders and how to make the rows and showed him how to plant the, 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 the seeds. And then he, he continued and showed him how to fertilize it and how to weed it and Titus learned how to, to do it by hand, you know, in, in a Zambian way, and, which was really cool. And really, there's not a whole lot of difference when it comes to just a small garden to a field of maize over there. It's really the same process, just a smaller area. And so what they do is, you know, when the rains come in about November, they go out, and even before then, they start cultivating that land. It's just when the rains get there, it softens up the ground a little bit, right? It hasn't rained for six months, so the ground's very hard. And so they cultivate that land. They, they get it prepared the way they're supposed to and in order that works best for them and their culture. And then they plant that seed. And they immediately put fertilizer on it. Makes sense, right? And after it starts growing, when the rains come, um, it gets all oh, about this high. They have to go out and start weeding it and take all the weeds out, make sure there's no weeds in there. And then they have to apply the second uh, amount of fertilizer, which is called decompound. They put that on there. And then hopefully in May, if everything goes right, they're going to have a wonderful harvest. And I, I would like to tell you that every time they all have a great, great maize field. Maize is their staple food. Well, they don't always. And they struggle with a lot of problems over there, you know, just like uh, many farmers do when it comes either too much rain or not enough rain, or, or they have over there what they call army worms. I think Tammy, you were telling me that there's army worms in Kansas right now or somewhere right now that are attacking the crops, right? Or there's too many termites and eating the stalks and they're falling over. So there's always an issue over there. 
But that's exactly kind of, a, the, or I should say, the way that they farm and do gardens. Now, you can, you can look at all, and it, it gets even deeper than that. The South Africans over there with all their farm equipment and everything. But when you break it down to the basic aspect and pieces and parts of gardening, you can break it down to this. If a gardener never plants a seed, then they're never going to have a harvest, right? You can, you can have the most beautiful um, garden you want, and you can do everything you have to do but not plant the seed, and guess what? You're not going to have a harvest. It might look good, but in however many months, it's, there's nothing going to be there. And it comes down to the same thing spiritually when it comes to us as believers. If a believer never shares the gospel, they're never going to be able to lead someone to Christ. Now, every now and then, God might uh, allow you to pick somebody else's fruit off the tree, you know, somebody labored, sharing the gospel, and that person comes along and says, hey, in whatever way, will you show me what it means to know Christ? And you get to pluck that fruit, praise the Lord. But most often time, that's not going to happen. You have to share the gospel. You have to plant that seed in order for someone to come to know Jesus as their Savior. So when it comes to what we've talked about all this time, leading someone to Christ and planting that seed should be a desire in your life. That should be a desire in your life. You can't get closer to Christ without him placing that desire on your heart to be able to fulfill the Great Commission. The closer that you get to, to the Lord, the more desire you're going to have to share. Um, in Psalm 37, 4, it says this, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. I love that verse. Because this says if you delight yourself, if you surrender, if you're, you put yourself in his hands and you become pliable to him and moldable and you're given everything you have to him, he takes his desire and puts it on your heart. In other words, his desire becomes your desire. Well, what's the desire of Jesus Christ? To fulfill the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? That none should perish, but that all come to repentance, right? And so with that, that should be our desire. The closer you get to him, the more desire that you will have. But you've got to plant that seed or there's never going to be a harvest. So today we're going to be discussing being an effective witness, okay? And in this, there's going to be one part that's tangible that you can actually put your hands on. But then others, it's going to be intangible. It's something that's going to take place in your mind and in your heart and in your life. Decisions that will have to be made in order to be an effective witness, so what does it mean to be effective? What does that word mean? It means successful in producing a desire or an intended result. You see, if we're going to be effective, we have to be effective in giving out the gospel and planting that seed because what do we want to do? We want to initially produce a desire in the life of somebody else to know Jesus as their Savior. We've been talking about salt and light. You take in a little bit of salt, what does that do? It places a desire to drink water, right? If we're that salt, we should be in the lives of others placing that desire that they're going to be attracted to Jesus Christ. That's our responsibility. But yet at the same time, if we're going to be effective, there's going to be an intended result. And what is that intended result? That someone might bow the knee and receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. See, we've got to be an effective witness. And there's ways that we're going to talk about doing that. The first one is this tangible piece. It's called a prospect list. Okay? In your yellow book there, there is an example of that. Right? Now, what this overall coming down to is just taking and organizing who you're talking to on a daily basis, weekly basis, and sharing the gospel with. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 says, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So you see the parts here when it comes to sharing. There are those that plant, those that actually put the seed in someone's heart of sharing the gospel. But then there are those who come by and encourage. And Paul the Apostle is the one who put himself as the planter. You know, so many times we want to, as Christians, want to lead someone to Christ. Or we should have that desire. But oftentimes we are the ones who plant, Right? So we should embrace even the opportunity to plant. But it was Apollos that came by and watered. But we see here, guess what happens? God's the one who gives the increase. He's the only one that has the power to bring somebody to himself, right? He draws them to himself. We're the ones that make people thirsty. 
but he's the only one that can save a soul. John 4, 38 says, I sent you to reap that wherein ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. You see, this is a teamwork. Many times when you go out there, and if you commit to the Lord, you're going to share the gospel here in this area. The chances are somebody else has already shared with him the gospel. You know, I was talking to a guy um, just a couple days ago. He was sharing with me. He was talking to a young man at a school and he started sharing with them the gospel. And this was years ago. And the kid said, oh, I, I've, I, I hear that at church all the time. People have already shared that with me. So see, he entered into the labor of somebody else. But it takes teamwork in order for this to happen. And often, even when you share the gospel, you're going to have to go back to that person many times in order for them to come to the know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Right? It doesn't always happen the first time. I don't know how many times it took me, but I heard it a handful of times before I finally submitted myself unto the Lord. But just like that gardener, to tend that crop, to tend that field, has to go back. He, ha he has to be willing to go back and to cultivate and to take care of. We have to do the same. We have to be willing to go back and take care of what God, the people's souls that God has placed in our life. So what is a prospect list? Here's what a prospect list is. It's a, a list is an effective tool that helps maintain relationships, right? That's all it is. It's that simple. It's a list that you design yourself that helps maintain these relationships. It's designed with a purpose of staying connected with those that you have made contact with, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? So when you look at it, life is about relationships. Everything that we do is about relationships, you enter into a family through birth. You have siblings, mom and dad, aunts and uncles, and you go to school. That's relationship. And then you go to college, and then you go to work, and whatever it might be. Every day we're dealing with relationships. But these days, people are trying to avoid those relationships rather than cultivate them, right? We're trying to stay away. We call it a social networking system, but it's antisocial because people try to stay away from one another these days compared to the way it used to be, right? So that's what a prospect list is. We, it's a, it's a, something that you are bringing together with your mind in order to organize the relationships. And now remember, we are approaching it from the place that you've already committed to go out and share the gospel with others, right? Because that's the way the Bible's approach. If you are a believer in Christ, then we are approaching it from that way. You are committed. So if you're committed, this is just one way that can help you organize. So who do I include in my prospect list? Anyone that you feel is a positive contact with sharing the gospel. It could be family, friends, a waiter, a waitress. It could be someone you meet in the park. It could be anybody. Those are the people that you see as a positive contact. Galatians chapter 6.10, we've mentioned this throughout the few weeks and even when Brownie was preaching. Uh, it says, as you therefore have opportunity. Your opportunity is all around us. You just have to see those opportunities and seize those moments and see the people as God sees them. Those that you may have shared the gospel with but have not come to Christ. And so what you're doing, again, you're like that gardener. You're going back and you're nurturing. You're making contacts. You're putting yourself in a place to where you can build relationships. So how do I use my prospect lists? You know, this is, remember, a design purpose. You have to be intentional about this. And you have to daily pray. Pray for those people. We talked much, a, a little bit about prayer last week. You can make many contacts. You can call. You can, you can even, wow, write a letter. Who does that anymore? Not very many people. You can email, send a card. You can WhatsApp, whatever it might be. You can do all this. But it's only God that can change the heart. God is the only one that can change the heart of a lost person. So God works through prayer. You have to be praying. You have to be praying for those souls. Contact them weekly. This takes many touches, right? This takes many opportunities to be able to share with them on a, daily, or on a weekly basis. Now, be careful, too. you got to be sensitive to the Spirit of God because you don't, as much as you want those people to be saved and you're sharing the gospel, you don't want to be a Christian stalker, you know? You don't want people to, to, to tag you or mark you that you're just not leaving them alone. And so what you have to do is be sensitive to the Spirit. He's going to tell you, the Spirit of God will tell you when it's time to move forward, when it's time to be aggressive, but when it's time to back off, when it's time not to say anything, right? But you can only know those things if you're 
close to the Lord, if you're spending time. I, I like Acts chapter 16, verse 6 through 9. Because in this passage, Paul the Apostle, he's on his mission trip, right? And he wants to go to Bisnia and Mythia is where he wants to go. That's his desire. He wants to go this direction. And the Holy Spirit tells him not to go, tells him to wait, don't go there. And I'm sure he was probably like, well, I don't understand why. Why, why am I not going here? It doesn't say that, but as a human, that's a, as a person, that's what I would be thinking. But then all of a sudden what happens is, is he has what we call the Macedonian call. There's a vision that he sees where a person from Macedonia says, help us. So you know what he does? He goes and helps him. He goes out east rather than west. He was sensitive to the Spirit of God. He knew when to say yes, and he knew when, when, when the Lord was saying yes, and he knew when the Lord was saying no. So we have to make sure that even though we're contacting people, that we're staying sensitive to the timing and the place where God is leading us. But then update regularly, like it says right there. If a person uses this list proper, properly, then they'll be have to continue to update. Uh, this means that you're going to have to be intentional with your time. You know, we, we say that we value time. But I'm sure that if we made a list of every minute, minute that we spend every day, a lot of us would see that we don't value time as much as we say we do. There's a lot of wasted time, you know, and I enjoy Netflix shows. It's probably the much of the rest of you, right? But there we are in a culture right now that spends so much time in front of that TV or, or something like that that steals our time from us, right? So we have to make sure that we're intentional with our time. We're going to invest in what's important to us. That's what it comes down to. So we have to make sure and update regularly. Now, again, that, in that yellow book you have, that's just an example. You, you can come up with your own way, your own way of keeping organized the people that you're talking to on a daily, weekly basis. Three by five cards, a notebook, whatever it might be. That's up to you. This is just one way. It's just directing you, showing you that we need to organize our conversations. We need to organize our relationships. So that's the tangible way when it becomes being an effective witness. But the second one here is not so tangible. It has to do with our minds. It has to do with our hearts. It has to do with our thought processes and where we stand and how we see Scripture and how we see people. But it's developing an everywhere mentality. Everywhere I go, I'm going to be a witness to Jesus. I'm on call 24-7, 365. That's our everywhere mentality. We have to see people as souls. And we've talked about this a few times the last few weeks, but, but we often, we don't see people this way. We see people as people. We might see them ethically or ethnically, or we might see them um, when it comes to economy-wise or where they're at financially or where they might live. That's oftentimes how we see people. But see, if we can get past all of that and we see people the way God sees, we're going to see them as a soul of value. So how do we see people? we got to see them as God sees them. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38, it says, But when we saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep, having no shepherds. See, Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the souls of people. They were in need of something. They needed him, and they didn't know it. And he, he knew that they were being led, but they were being led the wrong direction. They needed someone to lead them to the right place. And then what did he say? He said unto his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth labors into his harvest. The harvest is vast. There's people out there that want to know the truth, but we need laborers to go out and to share the truth. So why do we not go, church? What is it? Why do we not go? Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons, and we could spend a lot of time talking about this. But in this book, on page 119, not the yellow book you have, but the actual book itself, there's a quote, and I have, that, I have it up here from Pastor Chapel. He says, We too easily see people and are moved with frustration at the inconveniences they may bring, or we are moved by the intimidation of what they would say if we spoke up with truth. Those three pieces. There's so much truth in just this right here. Frustration, inconveniences, and intimidation, right? So let me ask you, do people frustrate you? 
<laughs> yeah, right. yeah, of course, yeah. And uh, do, do uh, people inconvenience you at times? Absolutely. But you know what? Let me tell you something. You frustrate people. <laughs> you inconvenience people. I frustrate people. I inconvenience people at times, you see. So this is something that is across the board for all of us. And often we look at people as a frustration or this is so inconvenient for what I'm wanting to do right now. And you know, God gave me a phrase a few years back for a situation like this. And, and for people who are lost and even those who are saved that may not be following the Lord. And also for myself, right? And it was this. It's, this is the phrase, consider the source. Consider where they're coming from. And what I mean is, is we're talking about majority of lost people here. They don't know any different. A lost person is someone who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. So we cannot hold that person accountable to Scripture. We can't hold them accountable to Christian living when they've never even made it to the cross, right? we got to get them to the cross so they know what God's standard is for them after they meet Jesus as their Savior. But oftentimes what we try to do is hold them to the same standard as us. They don't need, know any different. They're living the world as a lost person. So what, you know what we got to do? we got to consider where they're coming from. And you know when you do that, that frustration goes away. It doesn't so much be more of an inconvenience in your life because you know that they're bound by something that you were once bound by. And it gives you what? Compassion. Compassion for people, right? But then he comes down here and he talks about intimidation. Now that's for us. There's an intimidation factor when you go knock on a door or when you just walk up to somebody and say, hey, Jesus loves you, or can I share with you uh, the gospel of Jesus? However God would lead you in that conversation. But that's where we as a church, we have to claim God's word. We're either going to believe God's word or we're not going to believe God's word, right? Because we have to claim his promises. In John chapter 14, verse 26, it talks about that the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance the words that we need in order to share and talk, right? Do we believe that? Well, we say we do, but oftentimes the intimidation factor keeps us from living that out, right? But here's the thing you have to understand. You can't remember what's not there in the first place. If it's not there, how can you remember it? That means something needs to be there, right? God has the power. I have no doubt that if there's a verse in the Bible you've never even read, he could give it to you word for word in the moment that you need it. I have no doubt about that. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is, is that we have to draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to us. And as we're studying God's word and we're memorizing it, we get out there in a situation to talk to somebody, he will bring back to remembrance. The intimidation factor won't be there if we believe God's word. We have to develop a mindset in our life that we're ready to go, that we're ready to share the gospel in any situation, right? But we have to see people as God sees them as souls. The salt and light ministry that we're kicking off here should not be the only time that we're going out looking for opportunities. And that's the second one we're looking at, looking for opportunities. We have to look for opportunities to share. In other words, we have to pattern our life to look. Jesus patterned his life after the Father. I have no doubt that he, he wanted to fulfill the will of the Father. He listened to everything the Father he said. Paul the Apostle, he patterned his life after Jesus Christ. And Paul even said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so what was the will of God? It's the souls of people. And so we have to pattern ourselves after them always looking, always looking for the opportunities to share the gospel. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says this, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. See, when we're going out there for one and you're sharing the gospel, you shouldn't be doing it to please any man, Right? Not pleasing anyone. You, you might look good and be able to share the gospel perfectly, but if you're doing it for man, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, and there's loss in that. There will be loss in that, right? But we're supposed to be out there doing it for the Lord. And he's entrusted us with something so precious as the gospel. Now, maybe somebody in your life has given you something and entrusted you to have something. Could be money. It could be a possession. Maybe it was something special from your grandparents handed it down, a family heirloom. And they said, here, I want you to keep this, but I'm entrusting you with it. That means it's on your shoulders. Don't mess this up. 
Don't lose it, right? Keep it. Hold on to it. See, we have something more precious that's been entrusted to us. We've been entrusted with something that changes lives for all of eternity. All of eternity. And the beautiful thing about it is we're to keep it, but we're to also share it. So God entrusts us with it to do something with it. It flows in through us, out through us, into the lives of those around us. We have been put in trust with something as precious that can save the souls of people, right? But if you look at the end of this, it says, which tries our hearts. See, God has entrusted us with the gospel to give. He tries our hearts to see if we will. And I hope you listen to that. He's entrusted us with the gospel as a believer immediately. You've got it. But he's going to try your heart to see if you're going to. He's going to challenge your commitments. He's going to put you in vulnerable situations. You're either going to believe him by faith or you're not going to believe him by faith. He's going to try your hearts to see what you do with what he has entrusted in your life. So when you are going through the checkouts and you are going through those restaurants and, and you're sitting down and you're asking uh, your, your, your waiter or waitress if, if, if you can pray for them and share in the gospel or you're, you're just out and about, he's going to challenge you and move you if you're listening to the Spirit of God and ask you to do something, he's going to try your heart. He's going to try my heart. Remember Galatians 6.10, as you therefore have opportunity, are you looking for those opportunities? You don't have to pray for them. They're already there. You just have to look for them. Amen? And then stewarding relationships. This is important. We have to steward relationships when it comes to developing this everywhere mentality. We talked a little bit about that with the prospect list, right? That will help steward your relationships. So steward means this, manage or to look after. You're managing, you're, you're looking after these relationships. You're not just flippantly uh, talking and, and, and walking away from them and pretending like they don't mean anything. In John chapter 1, verse 41 through 42, this is speaking about Andrew. It says, he first findeth his own brother Simon, and he said it unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? I love this passage. You know, Peter is the one that most people identify with. I know I identify with him. Peter always put his foot in his mouth, was always, you know, uh, saying something he probably shouldn't have said, you know, and I find myself doing that. So I think a lot of us identify with him, right? But I want you to think about this. Peter is the one who preached the message at the day of Pentecost, right? He got up and he preached that message and 3,000 people came to know the Lord. Amen. But it was Andrew that brought Peter to Jesus. You know, isn't that special? It was Andrew that brought Peter to Jesus. What happens if Andrew did not bring Peter? You know, would, would have things changed? I don't know. Maybe Peter would have been there somehow, some way. But if Andrew had not said, hey, we found the Messiah. Here, I want to take you to him. See, that's what we should be longing after. We should be the Andrews of today's church going out there. Who cares if, if, God, if God uses us in a mighty way to be able to preach a message and 3,000 people come to know the Lord? Praise God. Amen to that. But our goal should not be that. It should just be bringing people to Jesus. See, Andrew was looking after his brother. He was stewarding this relationship. Now, again, uh, we know that they were brothers, so he was very important to him. So that speaks to our family, how we should be towards our family. But the principle still stands when it comes to even people we don't know, if we're seeing them as souls. He wanted what was best for his brother. Well, what's best, church? It's, the, it's Jesus. That's what's best. There's nothing else that can replace Jesus Christ in our lives. People for thousands of years have worked at replacing Christ and they have failed every time. I have worked at it. But what was best for me was Jesus. And I'm so thankful I entered into my relationship with him just over 20 years ago. Man, where would I be without him? And I, I, and I know all of you have an Andrew in your life. All of you have an Andrew as somebody who brought you to Jesus. See, it's about nurturing these relation, relationships. It's about praying for them on a daily basis, praying for that person, praying for those people. But at the same time, you have to maintain a good testimony. You know, you have to have a good testimony because you want people to be attracted, not pushed away from the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we have to make sure that we're the Andrews that God wants us to be. 
And then here, obey every prompting of the Holy Spirit. Prepare for a life for a moment like this. Well, what moment am I talking about? Go to Acts chapter 8 real quick. And we're going to read this entire passage. Um, it's about um, the Ethiopian eunuch. And I love this passage because we see in the life of Philip a man who was prepared. It says here in verse 26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Cadence, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning. So this man here was uh, what we call a proselyte. He, was, he, he had left his pagan ways and converted to Judaism. So he was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he reading Isaiah the prophet, then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understand thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. Now it was actually Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. But this is what it said. He said, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Amen? See, he was prepared he was prepared to share with this man about Jesus Christ. How I know this is because they were talking about the book of Isaiah. He had to know the book of Isaiah in order to be able to share with this man he's talking about Jesus Christ. He prepared his life for a moment like this. I'm, maybe he was a little nervous. I don't know. Maybe he was a little intimidated like what we talked about. But I love what he did because it, he obeyed. It says here, he ran. He didn't just wait. He didn't just um, kind of him haw around. He ran. He didn't look for a way out. He looked for a way too. And he ran to the man. And then he engaged him. And he jumped up in the chariot. And what did he do? He preached Jesus. He ran. Are we running to the lost? Are we going out to them looking for opportunities to share the gospel? So I'm going to share with you something that happened with me this last week. I was walking on the, um, the path right in front of Walmart, walking this whole area, getting my steps in. And you guys know, uh, many of you might know, where Coronado and Adams Dairy meet. There's a statue right there of some kids skateboarding. That's the statue. I'm coming around that corner, and there's a little hill right there. And there's a man sitting right next to the statue. And as soon as I went down that hill, right then the Lord prompted me, go back and talk to him. So I walked about 10, 10 seconds more. I walked a little bit further, and I, and I was contemplating, and I knew the Lord was getting a hold of me, and I, was, I finally, I stopped, and I said, okay, and I turned around, and I started going back, and while I'm walking, I'm praying, Lord, I'm getting ready to enter into a battle here, right? I'm getting ready to talk to this guy. I don't know how, how, how I'm going to start this. Please give me the words. I'm going to claim your promises here. I don't, you know, this is a little nerve-wracking. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know where he's at. But Lord, I'm going to trust in you. And I get back there, and he's gone. He's gone. And, uh, you know, the first thought that popped in my head was, like, because I wasn't gone that long, I didn't think, was Hebrews, where it talks about, don't you know you've entertained angels unaware? And I'm like, uh-oh, okay, something happening here. And was I being tried, like we talked about? But then I looked down the pathway, and he was already way down the path. You know what? I failed in that moment. I did not listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I gave it about 10 seconds. And so because I gave it 10 seconds, I gave him 10 seconds to go. And my prayer is for that man, somebody else will bring into his life someone who will share with him the gospel. And I go around and I look and I've been walking around that looking for him, hoping I might see him again. See, it's very important you understand that when God prompts you to do something, we've got to do it right then. We've got to run to them 
Because their soul is valuable. God died for them. We cannot hesitate. And when we do, it could be tragic, right? We know ultimately it'll be on that person, but we have some responsibility. You see, I was partially obedient because I went back. But if you're partially obedient, you know what? You're full disobedient to the Lord. That's what it comes down to. And praise God for his grace and mercy. Amen. And I wish I could give you a better illustration that happened this week, but I'm sharing with you the truth. I'm being transparent here because, guys, we do fail at times, but we have to learn through those failures. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says this, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. See, a person can be drunk with many things, not just wine. Be drunk with drugs, a person, fame, glory, honor, um, sports, you know, family, could be anything, a career, and anything that you allow in your life to control you, to keep you from thinking properly, because that's what alcohol does. It keeps us from thinking properly, right? But it says here, but be you filled with the Spirit. It's okay to be controlled by the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God is always connected to holiness and righteousness, and it's always got its eyes on eternity that's going to glorify Jesus Christ. You see, so it's okay to be filled with with the Holy Spirit. So we need to obey every prompting of the Spirit of God. This third piece here, what helps us to be more effective, is to stay motivated. This is a very important piece. Again, in these books, there are illustrations, and here's another illustration I, I want to share with you. There's a man by the name of Bernard Kip Lagat, a world-class runner from Kenya, who has set records for the 1,500, the 3,000, the 5,000 meter runs. During the 2000 Sydney Olympics, someone asked him how his country was able to produce so many great distant runners. Um, and he shared with them, this is their Kenyan strategy. He said, it's the road signs. Beware of lions, right? Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> you, you know, you got to outrun the lion. You got to be faster than the lion. You see what I'm saying? That was a tongue-in-cheek joke, but he was sharing his motivation, right? That was their motivation to outrun lions. Well, our motivation obviously has to be built on something that's important to us. Outrunning lions, what's important is your life, right? You want to survive that moment. But for us, our motivation has got to be about that which is eternal. If we don't have the right motivation, then it can be tragic for others. Oftentimes, when it comes to our motivation, we find something to replace it. And like I said earlier, we invest in what's important to us. We have to be careful that something doesn't win our affections. Because if it wins our affections, it will take place of our motivation. So church, what does motivate us? And I, you see up there the love of Christ. This is a very important one. 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says, For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for God, uh, one died for all, then all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for all them, or for them, and rose again. There's a lot here in this. But what we see, it's his love that constrains us. We have to remember that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for others, but it's also for you. It's not just a place that, that saved your soul, but it's a place that you live in. But you have to remember that the gospel is so precious that Jesus Christ and his only begotten son specifically to die for you. His love for you should constrain us and keep us from giving up. It's got to keep us from walking away. Where else are we going to go, church? Where else do we have to go? There is no place else to go when you know Jesus as your Savior. We've got to take this personally that this also is for us. And you know, as I was going through this, I thought of like a bowling alley, right? We've all been bowling, and we enjoy bowling. Some of us do, some of us don't. But there's an alleyway, right? And when you're bowling, your goal is to throw the ball down the alley to knock down all of those pins without going in the gutter. Well, oftentimes we all end up in the gutter most of the time, right? But you know, when it comes to our children, what do we do? We go over to the machine, we push the button, and all of a sudden on the sides, these bumpers come up, right? The bumpers are there. So when the kids throw down the alley, it bumps to the right and then to the left and to the right and to the left. And then they have a victory of knocking down the pins, right? 
and, and, and they jump and they turn around. They're excited about what they've done. But what was it that kept that ball on the alleyway was those bumpers. You see, those bumpers are the love of Christ in our life. Jesus Christ has given us an alleyway. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's our alleyway. And we have to not be prideful enough not to push the button to put those bumpers up. Because as we're going down this life and we're walking with him, he puts those bumpers up and that's the love of Christ. And we start going off to the right and we bounce off that bumper. When we come to the left, we bounce off that bumper. We come back and the next thing you know, we're knocking down some pins down there. and We're leading people to Christ. We make it to the end and we're standing before the Lord. Praise God, right? You see, that's the bump, but what do we do? Oftentimes we get away from the Lord. We don't draw nigh to him. And we get prideful and we go over that machine, we push the button and those bumpers go down and we think we got this. And then all of a sudden, where do we find ourselves? In the gutter. Find ourselves in the gutter. But then God's grace and mercy, we cry out to him. And what does he do? He gets us out and he puts us back in the machine and, and he goes over and pushes the button. Those bumpers come back up and we're on that lane again. You see, that's the love of Christ. It keeps us from giving up. It keeps us from moving aside. And it says here that because of what he's done for us, we should live for him, not for ourselves. Church, it's only reasonable that we live for him. It's only reasonable that we leave those bumper guards up so that we stay on that right path. It's the love of Christ that constrains us. And then the reality of the eternity. I know we've talked about this. We get so caught up with the distractions of this world, don't we? I mean, there's some real distractions. There's some real things around here. COVID is one. Afghanistan, what's taking place? It's terrible. Politics. All these things, right, that are real, that are out there, that we need to be aware of, that we need to be informed on, but they should never consume our lives. We can't allow them to consume our lives because when they're consuming our lives, guess what happens? We're forgetting about the big picture. We're forgetting about eternity. We often forget that heaven is real and hell is real and everybody's going to be in one or the other because we allow these distractions to come in our life. We read through a, a few weeks ago Luke chapter 16, 19 through 25, and we're not going to go through it today. But this is the story of the rich man. And in this book, he was talking about a pastor who reads this passage every day because the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, paradise, where the rich man went to hell. And he would go and read this every day, always to keep his mind on the place that hell is a real place. It's a reality. And when I was reading through this, I saw that the word torment comes up four times. Just in this passage, in 19, uh, Luke 16, 19 through 25, four times it comes up. And you know what torment means? It means grief. It means sorrow. It means intense pain. You realize that that's what hell is. It's an eternity of grief, sorrow, and intense pain. And as I was thinking about this, this passage was just written less than 2,000 years ago, right? And so... We don't know exactly when this true story took place of rich man and Lazarus, but Jesus gave us an account. But let's say it just happened right before Jesus was talking. That means less than 2,000 years ago, a man entered into hell and he experienced grief. He experienced sorrow and he experienced intense pain. It's been 2,000 years and guess what? Nothing's changed for this man. He's still experiencing grief. He's still experiencing sorrow. He's still experiencing intense pain. And you know what's going to happen in 2,000 more years? He's going to be experiencing grief, sorrow, and intense pain. In a million years, he's going to be experiencing it. Nothing is going to change for this man. See, that's what we need to be thinking about. And there's nothing that we can do to change anything for him. But there are something we can do for those who are around us. We do have an opportunity to share the gospel. So we have to make sure that we have compassion for them, compassion for the lost. Have a reality, but understand what this compassion is. In Matthew 9, 36, Jesus, we've already read this passage, but Jesus is talking about the multitudes and how they, they um, were as a, a, a sheep without a shepherd. And it moved him to do something about it. And there's another quote here in the book on page 131 by uh, Pastor Chapel that says, compassion begins when we see, really see people. It's when we see people as God sees them. That's when true compassion happens. 
Eternal compassion. You see, there is such thing as a worldly compassion. A worldly compassion, it fades away. You might be driving down the road, something break your heart, something move you. You might see somebody holding up a sign. You might even help them out. But that will fade. We don't think about people in that way all the time. But see, that type of compassion as it goes, but if you have eternal compassion, it's something that sticks with you at all times. It never leaves you. You're always thinking the way God thinks. You're always understanding where people are going to end up. That right there gives us passion that brings forth action. That's what compassion does. It forces you to have action in your life. And then the last one here is the one I, many of you probably like you knew we were going to get to, the judgment seat of Christ. You can go ahead and flip over to Revelation chapter 4 because we're going to end there. But you have to understand, church, one day we're all going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. But this passage right here, there's a change in our posturing if you look at this passage in Romans 14. Romans 14 is up here, but you can flip over to Revelation 4. Romans 14 says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See, we're going to be standing before him. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, So then every one of us shall give an account unto himself to God. We're all going to give an account of ourselves. I'm not going to give an account to you, for you. You're not going to give an account for me. You're going to stand before the Lord on your own, by yourself, having to look at the Creator, God, in front of you and give an account for your entire life. This is for those who know Jesus as their personal Savior. But it says right here, all will stand. But then it says, all will bow. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But this day right here is going to be a day of joy for some, but it's going to be sorrow for much. See, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ took care of our sin on the cross. Amen? Our sins were taken care of. He died for the sin of the world. He, he became sin. He took the sin upon himself. And for those who place their faith and trust in Jesus, he gives them his righteousness, his perfection. He switches places with us, right? That's the sin of the world. But it's our sins after salvation that will limit what we receive at the judgment seat of Christ. It's our sins after salvation that's going to limit us. And God wants us to have an inheritance. And what we say yes to him about will gain. But what we say no to him, there will be loss. So when you go over here, to, I want you to look at what happens from the time we stand to the time we kneel. Look at Revelation chapter 4, verse 10. It says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know what's going to happen at that moment, and I don't know if it's going to be individually. Right here it's collectively. But we're going to stand to be judged. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bow down and we're going to take that inheritance and those crowns and we're going to cast them back to the Lord because no matter what happens, no matter what we see, no matter what we face in this life, the only one that is worthy and worthy of everything is Jesus Christ. He's worthy of everything. Anything we could ever obtain, he deserves it and needs to be given back to him because he is worthy. These are our motivations, church. How will we stand before the Lord? What is important to us? You know, we've talked about the use of a proper list of stewarding these relationships. That should be important to us. We've talked about developing an everywhere mentality. We've got to pattern our lives of looking. We've got to um, put ourselves out there and live by faith and become vulnerable in the hands of God. And we've got to prepare for the moments that God's going to give us to be able to share the gospel and then we saw in these four points we've got to stay motivated. So church, let me ask you, what's important to you? What is it that's important to you? What's important to me? Because whatever it is is what we're going to invest in. And I hope and pray that what you see on this next slide is what's important to you. It's what we showed in, in week one. This is what we showed here in week one. A Christless eternity. At this moment, there's approximately 5.46 billion people that are on their way to hell. 
a Christless eternity. That should move us, church. Everything that we've spoken about must be done with a designed purpose. So what is our designed purpose? It's that simple message right there. Go, win, baptize, and teach. That's our job. To go out and share the gospel. Win them to Christ. See them take a step of commitment through baptism. And then put them in a place and, a, and watch God put them in a place to where they can grow, mature into a Christ-likeness. See, that's our responsibility, church. We've got to take this personally. My question is, is are, are we going to do something about this? You're going to have that opportunity right now. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to turn this back over to Brownie and allow him to share with you some things and the direction that he's taken us when it comes to our salt and light. But I want you to think about right now how God is going to use you in this commitment. Father God, we love you so much, and thank you for this time. Thank you for this past four weeks and all that you've done to, to show us the value of a soul, to show us the importance of leading people to Christ and, and how it needs to be in our minds and our hearts. And everywhere we go, Lord God, we need to take it personally. Lord, help us in our motivations. Help us to be motivated by the judgment seat of Christ. Help us to be motivated by seeing people as you see them, Lord, and knowing this Christless eternity is coming. Lord, I'm asking that you would move in the hearts of our church body, move in the hearts of the members here. Maybe if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, they will understand that Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. They have to get on that alleyway in order to be able to stand before you one day. So Lord God, do an amazing work within this body. Lead us, guide us, and direct us, and convict us, Lord. We love you and praise you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.